Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Lucena Lau Valle, Program Officer with California Humanities. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, California Humanities is the nonprofit state partner to the National Endowment for the Humanities. The Art of Storytelling program celebrates and engages the public in the visual stories across California. The Black Joy program that we'll be exploring tonight was organized by Chapter 510 in partnership with Nomadic Press. It was a 10 week long creative writing and publishing project for young black boys aged 13 through 19. This project emerged out of Chapter, 10, Chapter 510's Beauty and Difference program, which includes three collaborative anthologies by young emerging writers, Quip, Queer Youth in Print, Behind Our Names, an anthology of Swana and Muslim identified teens, and of course, Black Joy, an anthology of black boy pro poems, which we're celebrating tonight. And for those of you who don't know, Chapter 510 is a made in Oakland youth writing bookmaking and publishing center. Their teaching artists, staff and volunteers work side by side with educators to provide a safe space and supportive community with a focus on BIPOC and queer young people to bravely write. If you'd like to support the work of Chapter 510 as a teaching artist, volunteer or donor, or if you want to participate in their free youth writing and publishing programs as a young person, you can learn more at chapter510.org. If you'd like to purchase the Black Joy Anthology, you can do so at the online youth bookstore on Chapter 510's website or at nomadicpress.org. The Humanities for All Quick Grant Program was created to support the impactful public humanities experiences that amplify the vo voices of folks across our state. And I can think of no better example of this vision than the Black Joy Program. Tonight, we'll be hearing from the youth poets who took part in this program and hear from the teaching artists who provided mentorship. Throughout the event, you can send questions for our panelists through the Q&A feature on your Zoom dashboard. Due to limited time, we may not be able to answer all the questions. Also, if you're seeing many boxes with no webcams on, you can shut off the non-video participants' cameras from your gallery view. We will send instructions on how to do that in the chat. So now I'd like to take a moment to introduce Daniel Summerhill, the teaching artist for Black Joy and our moderator and MC for the evening. Hailing from Oakland, California, Daniel Summerhill is an assistant professor of poetry and social action and composition studies at California State University, Monterey Bay. He is the author of Divine, 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 forthcoming from Nomadic Press, a semi-finalist for the Charles B. Wheeler Poetry Prize. He is the 2015 New York Empire State Poetry Slam champion and the 2015 Nitty Gritty Grand Slam champion. Daniel was the lead teaching artist for Chapter 510's Black Joy Youth Creative Writing and Publishing Project, and he'll be our moderator and MC for tonight. So now let's proceed with the main program. And just to double check, can everyone hear me? Uh, if you can't, just uh, let me know here. Um, hopefully you're cool. All right, get thumbs up. Cool, cool, cool. Um, all right, so so I have the joy of moderating and, and kind of introducing some of the folks that um, you'll hear from tonight, which I'm, I'm really excited about, because um, not only were the students of the Black Joy Workshop, you know, phenomenal, but they also had phenomenal mentors that helped them along the way as well. So, um, so I'm excited for that, and, and I'm excited for Cal Humanities to be able to, to to put this event on for us to kind of showcase the work that they that they did. Um, so I will say that I do miss seeing the, the Black Joy authors, the students every Saturday. They energized me and allowed me into their lives, their passions and their interests. The Black Joy project was especially important because it allowed us to come together every week and not only write poems, um, but also share communal atmosphere rooted in joy. I loved workshopping and writing poems, but the best moments were the candid moments of sharing um, stories and cracking jokes. The world needs more Black joy, more Black boys smiling. Chapter 510 allowed us the space in the production to be able to, to be free and supported in our pursuit of understanding poetry and joy. It started out as a workshop that their parents signed them up for, and that's, you know, that actually happened. So I asked them, you know, why are you guys here? Um, and not all of them, but, but a few of them were like, yo, you know, mom signed me up, you know, so, so I'm here. Um, 
and, and so it started out as that, uh, and by the end, it turned into a space where, where they were all kind of proud and excited to be a part of it. And again, I'm, I'm forever grateful to Chapter 510, to Nomadic Press, and to Cal Humanities for, for kind of being able to, to, to create such a production. Um, so the work that Black Joy culminated in is as present and immediate as ever, um, and Black Joy is as necessary as ever. Breonna Taylor's murder is getting off, though unsurprising, still weighs heavy, especially while seeing photos of her living and thriving and smiling and basking in her joy prior to being executed by the state. So this work and work like it speaks directly to the system that allowed for black bodies to be taken and allows for black bodies to be taken at will. I also want to, to say um, that although we have the pleasure of hearing from a couple of the, the authors of Black Joy, we won't get a chance to hear from uh, four others that were actually, of course, featured in the, the anthology. So we won't get a chance to hear from um, Julian uh, Khalil Allen, Damian Evans, Charles Hall, um, or Nikos uh, Hubbard Riley, but know that their work is as phenomenal and brilliant. And if you don't have the anthology, check it out um, so that you can get a chance to hear from those um those writers as well all right great so now i get the opportunity to introduce uh the the, the poets um from the black joy anthology um so i'm going to start uh with samuel getacho who is a poet and activist from oakland he was uh, he recently graduated from oakland tech um so you know shout out to that and is a two, 2018 oakland vice uh, youth poet laureate and a 2019 young arts winner in spoken word in his spare time, he can be found searching for reasons not to write and listening to music. Black joy to Samuel means reclaiming our rights to black bodies and black lives. Sam. Thank you so much for that introduction, Daniel. Um, I'm gonna read a poem for you guys. Uh, this poem um, is one of the ones that was published in the anthology um, and it's called Circus of Oaks. Some days I don't recognize my city anymore. The new dressed up Oakland I can't afford and some days I become a circus attraction in my own home, become the diversity factor of a room and everything my Oakland is or used to be becomes display case and I become relic. An artifact worth framing but not saving and some days I have to force myself to break the glass that they trapped us in exhibit A. I enter a coffee shop I grew up going to and a chorus of pale mouths gape so I laugh. All of my teeth sharp and showing wider than their audience and this performance becomes defiance. And defiance becomes first Fridays, becomes dancing through the gunshots, becomes a performance despite, becomes protest. And protest becomes the cookout and the music and the laughter and the laughter and the laughter and the smell of frying fish drifts out from somewhere nearby and I convince myself that last night's food trucks are lingering here instead. The smell of defiance and Korean fusion tacos and weed and gasoline and sweat and permanence exhibit B. The music at first Friday ends sooner now. An eight o'clock noise ordinance choking the soul out of telegraph nights. A new art gallery sits on the corner. A new cafe weaseled itself across from the beauty supply. West Oakland morphing into a hipster's dream exhibit C. Today, I watch as an old black man gets out of his car and bursts into song. Half the block stares, startled by such a bold show of presence, captivated by this spectacle. The trapeze artist missed the net. The line escaped. This was not supposed to happen. And with 13 pairs of eyes on him, he sings a fight song for our city syncopates his footsteps with the heartbeat of these streets and I seem to be the only one who can hear them both and in this moment my Oakland is revived, rises up from the grave around me, becomes alive again in an earth-shaking chorus of we are still here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Samuel. Um, if you're at home, you know, and you want to make some noise, do so for Samuel. Phenomenal. It was great working with Sam um, throughout the process, and he's mad talented in so many different ways. Um, actually, in a lot of ways, I, I thank him for being a part of, you know, Black Joy instead of like the other way around. You know, he showed me a lot of things, and I was able to kind of um, enter his world and his creativity. And um, we'll get a chance to to kind of wrap in just a bit um, and, and pick his brain a little bit more. Uh, so nice work, Samuel. Um, next, we're, we're 
we're trying to get um, Elijah uh, into the into the, the Zoom here, and we're having some difficulties. Um, so what I'll do, um, let's see here. I'm not sure. Yeah, he's still not here. Um, yeah, he's still not here. So so while we're waiting on on Elijah to join us, um, we'll go ahead and we'll jump into a few questions actually. So Sam, if you don't mind. Um, just hopping back on, un, uh, turning your video back on, and me and you will wrap for just a few minutes while we're waiting on Sam, I mean, I'm sorry, waiting on Elijah to, to jump in. Um, cool, so I have a few questions, Sam, and uh, just kind of, you know, flow from wherever you, wherever you want or see fit. Um, so, as I mentioned, it was a pleasure working with you, but also, after, you know, after the workshop, I was able to kind of um, into your space and your life and learn a little bit more about, you know, not only your writing, but also your activism. Um, and so along those same lines, so you actively work for racial equality and, and injustice, um, and especially recently. So are you making space for joy is, is part of the question. Do you have room for it? Can you, um, can joy and struggle exist in the same body? And what are your thoughts about, about that? Like how, how you've been able to kind of operate and move recently, but then just in general? I think I, I definitely have trouble with the term activist, and I think I have I have a lot more trouble with it now than I than I probably did in in two thousand and eighteen, um, and I've kind of since stopped self identifying as one, um, and that's not because I think that there's anything you know wrong with being an activist at all, but. I think when we relegate certain people to the role of activist, it kind of starts to feel like a reason or an excuse to get lazy. Um, and I think, you know, if, if you convince yourself that it's okay because there are activists doing the work and that is, you know, that means that you don't have to, I, I think I started relaxing into that. And, and so that's when I started to take issue with it. But it's like, I think I always think about this one Asada Shakur quote that I'm definitely paraphrasing, but she, she talks about how, in another life, she might have been a sculptor or a painter and about how being an activist was never something that she chose to do, but something that she felt obligated to do. And I think that that's kind of what my relationship with activism has really felt like for, for, my, for pretty much all of my admittedly, you know, at the short lifespan <laughs> up to this point. But I think, you know, it, it really is hard to be fighting for what is essentially basic recognition as a human being and and not have that take a mental toll um and i'm definitely you know there there are people who've been doing who, who dedicate their entire lives to work like this and, and who have done it for years and, and for much longer than i've even been alive who still struggle with finding the balance between work and joy and so i'm i'm definitely you know not at the point of, of striking what I think is a healthy balance yet, but I'm trying my best. I think I, I, I'm definitely guilty of doing the whole, you know, overwork, burn out, you know, collapse for a few weeks and then repeat kind of cycle. Um, but, I, but I also think it's interesting the way that the pandemic has isolated us. It, it kind of forces you to confront yourself and, and all, of the, all of the not so savory things. Um, and so, I've definitely been been trying to treat joy as more of a practice um, because before it was like more of something that I kind of happened upon, right? It was like, oh, I, I'm going to this event. I'm going to see my friends. And it's kind of like those things, those pockets of joy are like easily discoverable. Whereas now it's it's like, if I don't actively take time out to take care of myself and do and, and treat joy as a discipline, treat joy as a practice, it, it, no one else is going to do that for me because it, we're in such an isolated time where you can't really happen upon it in such a way. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best. Um, I think yeah. it's definitely possible, but it's, it's not easy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so many things to unpack, um, Sam, that you, that you mentioned. Um, one, one of the things though, that I heard and that I think is important also is that, um, you know, joy, I'm sorry, not joy, activism is not like a one, one size fits all thing, right? It's not like there's one way to be an activist or there's one way to, to fight for justice, right? Um, and there's, there's folks that are on the front line, right? Uh, that, you know, maybe 
out there protesting or, or whatnot. But there's also all kind of other work that has to be done, um, even behind the scenes, folks that may not even be seen. And so in a lot of ways, I think about, um, you know, allowing yourself, you know, the, the, the space to be like, okay, I can't be on the front line because maybe that's not what, what I'm capable of. That's just not what I can do, right? There's folks that can, but that's just, maybe that's not my role. Um, and allowing yourself to be like, okay, well, what is my role and how can I contribute um, to fighting for equality and, and, and injustice? Um, and then also what I heard too, is that like, you have to like intentionally create space and time um, for joy, right? And to, to make that a continuous and ongoing thing. Um, Cause the word practice is not like, oh, I'm gonna do it once. It's like, no, I have to continuously kind of remind myself and work at, you know, making space for joy and, and, and taking care of yourself. Um, so we're, so thank you for, for sharing that. We do have Elijah in the building, um, I guess in the virtual building. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna introduce Elijah. He's gonna share a piece or two and then we'll jump back into the interview. So uh, let's see here, give me one second. All right, Elijah, Elijah P. Henson was born and raised in Oakland and recently graduated from MetWest High School. He's been a part of many programs, including Past and Present, Chapter 5 on those Youth Oral History Publishing Program, the Hidden Genius Project, the Youth Heart Clinic Center. And aside from writing, Elijah also enjoys drawing and playing video games. Black joy to him is the ability to be free and express oneself with no censor. Go ahead and take it away, Elijah. Good evening. Um, this first poem will be uh, called One of a Kind. It's about friends. Squad, my squad. There ain't no other like it, and there will be no other like it. Team, my team. At the house playing video games, with countless hours being dashed away into the void that is time. An audience circles around the portal to another realm, with our only link to it, four GameCube controllers. Every attack is followed with a smattering of trash talk and amazement. Electric bolts of excitement strike through us with each victory. Scorpion versus Sub-Zero, Captain Falcon versus Ganondorf, a portal with infinite realities. Units, my units. The craziest and best of conversations are held within these circles with laughter so loud and borderlines on obnoxious at times, but devil may care. Friends, my friends. The quakes of life will occasionally shake our base from time to time. What matters is do we have strong enough support to not crumble when they do shake? Say what you will about the lone wolf, but who will be there to help him rebuild his wreckage when disaster arrives? From simple breakup to shattering divorce, we shall not crumble, for there is no one like us and will be no one like us, because my brothers are my brothers. All right, so... Um... This next one I got is actually not from the book. It's a new piece. It's called The Sun is Blocked. <clears throat> All right. The sun is blocked. The sun is blocked. Blocked by a column of sharp glass and ice cold steel. First it was one, and then suddenly pop, pop, pop. My own city changing right before my eyes. Mom and pops assassinated by ninjas wearing suits and ties, disguising lies as deals. Just take it to guarantee a meal. Not thinking long run, their Waffle Hut turns into a Starbucks, making 1% of the big bucks. Everything that the calm shadow touches is future property. Segregation no longer needed, just find the line of poverty. Hoods paused in time, never changed, never improved. That broken payphone has been on the block since 92. California, the epicenter of technology. But something troubles me about who really has the opportunity and advantage to create solutions, making problems vanish. My hood are represented, big tech lacking our perspective on what the real issues are. The mentally ill with no home. Our mortality defined by zip codes. Lacking money when that rent's owed. I can't be the only one that's bothered. We're far from done making life easier for our future daughters and sons. Make them be able to enhance their finance. So generations beyond that they got a chance to make it to the top and dance with the suns and stars. We're gonna break out this cell, bar for bar. That's all I got. 
Thank you, Elijah. Thank you, Elijah. That was so fresh. Uh, I haven't heard that new one. So, so dope. Thanks for sharing that new piece um, with us. And then the, 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 the piece that you did share from the anthology is one of my favorites. And I want to talk about it just for a second. Um, so your work, that poem in particular, um, revolves around your kind of communal experiences of joy, um, such as your friends, as you call them, or your squad, right? So why did you choose to consider friends when you wrote about joy? Like, what's the importance of friends when thriving in joy? Well, there's many, like, terms and, like, just sayings that, you know, to, like, you know, it's like, like, for example, like, it takes a village or unity is strength and that sort of thing. And there's power with multiple people and being in one area. And it's important for friends to exist, you know, for people. And it's just like, you know, you know, you need somebody to, you know, at times, you know, cheer you on, but also to criticize you, you know, a yes man is not a friend as well. Like, cause you know, if you have a, if you have a whole bunch of yes, uh, people that just say yes to everything that you do, you're not improving. You're just, you know, staying the same person and you may even actually have, have uh, worse in your qualities that you do have, right? So you, a good friend to me is people that are like, hey, they, cheer, they, 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 they congratulate you. They uh, cheer you on for what your quality that you do have. But there's also the fact of, hey, I see that you're liking in this sort of thing. Like, you know, maybe you should work on that, uh, work on that certain quality that you have. Like, you know, um, make, give you stronger armor, if that makes sense. So that's what that's what I feel like the power of a friend is, you know, to improve yourself, yeah. improve each other. And, you know, that, if that mutual relationship of improving, that's going to make us all stronger in the long run. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 100 percent. I agree with you. And I'm glad that you're like you've realized that um, so early in life. Right. The fact that uh, a yes man is not a friend. That's huge. Right. Um, friendship is about is about love and love is not always like being a yes man or, or um, about the pretty times. It's also about the, the challenging right of 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 your friends. Right. If they're doing something that may not be beneficial to them right, to themselves. Right. Or right. figuring out ways to kind of push each other to be better and, to, you know, just to be to thrive a little bit better on Earth. Right. And so that's the definition of a friend. Right. Or, or of love. Um, which is what you should have with your friends. So thanks for sharing that. And also, again, during the workshop, you know, it just amazed me that you decided to go with that and to use that refrain, right? That that friends, my friends kind of um, refrain. And I think it came through. Um, so Sam, you want to jump back in for just one second. And what we're going to do is I want to ask you all both. So I'll give you each a chance to answer this question. Um, so how has the, the Black Joy Workshop shaped the activities and things you do now? Or has it at all, you know, what have you kind of taken from it and how has it manifested it, um, itself in, in your lives just now, today? So either one of you all can start. Feel free to jump in. Um, I, I can go. Um, I think both experiencing the workshop as a TA and then also as a participant was was a really valuable experience, I think. Um, I, I mean, I, I did a few workshops at my high school, um, some independently that I taught, and then some that I collaborated um, with other OUSD students on, um, was able to do uh, classroom visits um, in my term as 2019 Oakland Youth Poet Laureate. I was able to visit like elementary schools. And so I think having the Black Joy Workshop be my Kind of introduction into into what it's like to to view it from an educator's perspective was was really valuable um especially because up to that point for me all of my poetry experience had been because of people who had created those spaces for me and who were really patient with me in in, in the earliest stages of my writing and so i think it just it it showed me in a really big way the value of coming from a teaching perspective as well um and then also it was just it was really nice i think to be able to be in community with other young black men who were writing um and I, and that's a lot rarer than i think you'd think it is um especially because you know it the activities that, that were kind of relegated to that were told are for us very very rarely have anything to do with writing <laughs> Um, and so, and to, to be in a writing space with other young black men was really, it's an experience that I haven't really had anything similar to since then. And it was something that stuck with me. So fresh. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, um, for sharing that, sharing your experience. I know you're, you're like an all-star too. So when you came to the workshop, I appreciated, you know, all of your, your insights and, and jumping into workshop and, and providing like the things, the knowledge you already did have. 
um, to share that with other folks, because um, I think folks learn from you as well. Um, Elijah, you want to jump in and answer the, the same question? How has the Black Joy Workshop kind of manifested itself in your life now? Uh, yes, most definitely. Um, i say that uh, Black Joy, most importantly, just helped me improve my writing. Um, I've dabbled in it from time to time beforehand, just like, of course, like, you know, writing essays and whatnot, and like, you know, through reading books and that sort of thing. And, you know, um, usually I'm the kind of person that likes to like draw things and like, and then uh, and, like, you know, paint pictures and whatnot, not exactly paint, but more like draw a pencil because I don't really do the paintbrush like that. But um, <laughs> I say that uh, words are different and that, you know, it's kind of like um, the person already has a paintbrush. It's just left to you to give the paint, if that makes sense. So it's like um, the best thing for me was just like, I'm just figuring out how, uh, what words can I use to improve the quality of that paint, if that makes sense. So it was just um, figuring out like vocabulary and whatnot, be like, you know, simple words that we use from time to time are like, okay, how can we spice that up and have like a similar word that's like that, but it's like enhances the thing. Like, you know, it gives like a more visceral feeling to the writing. And yeah. um, that was probably one of the biggest things for me is just uh, learning through that and um, yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. All right, cool. Just a couple, a couple of minutes here for for you two. Last question for both Sam. I'll start with you. And this question is: What are you working on now? Are you still writing? And if you are writing, what are you working on now? Um, I am still writing. I don't think I could escape it if I tried <laughs> at this point. Um, but uh, I'm really, and and this kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier. But I'm really trying to find. Um, more of a rhythm, more of a discipline with my own writing, because, you know, when we've kind of been prevented from having these spaces of community that we're so used to physically um, with workshops, with open mics and things like that, it's really been an interesting process of like renegotiating with myself of why I write and when I write and, and how I have that relationship with writing when other people aren't involved. Um, and so I'm, I'm working on that. I'm working on branching out beyond poetry, which has been an interesting experience. I got the chance to dabble in playwriting earlier this year. Um, I'm trying to commit to, to a little bit more essay writing, a little bit more prose. So that's- Can you tell folks where else your work's been published at? Cause I know you're being mad humble right now, but like, where are some of the platforms that, that you have work at? Um, earlier this year, I, I published um, an opinion essay in the Washington Post. Um, and the year before that, um, I published a similar essay in the New York Times. So I'm trying to trying to make the grind more of a frequent thing and less of a once a year thing, <laughs> which is kind of what it was, is I, I wrote poems and then every once in a while I would write an opinion piece. Um, but I'm trying to, trying to commit to that a little bit more and trying to, and, and you know, putting yourself out there, pitching pieces, trying to get published is so much riskier and more nerve wracking of an experience than going to an open mic. And so, and it's also just, I'm way more used to even like competitive poetry spaces. It's a poetry space and that's like my comfort zone. So trying yeah. to put myself out there more. Yeah, no, absolutely. hundred um, percent. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for the bravery of putting yourself out there. Thanks for your writing and continue to share it. Uh, please, please, please. Elijah, what are you working on? Are you still writing? Um, yeah. Does, uh, that for that new piece that I actually shared was uh, part of a song that I wrote for a Salesforce competition. Um, it just to digress. I'm part of this program called the Hidden Genius Project, and the Hidden Genius Project trains and mentors Black male youth in technology creation, entrepreneurship, and leadership skills to transform their lives and communities. So, uh, staff from there basically said, like, "Hey, I know that you're interested in making music as well. So, uh, we got this uh, little contest for you to go to." So I. Um, wrote the lyrics basically. And uh, thanks to Black Joy, I already had some experience in you know, writing poetry. And of course, you know that poetry is rap and rap is poetry and that whole communion. So I uh, you know, essentially practiced my, uh, my skill by making that song. And it uh, actually helped me win second place in it. And I'm very happy about it. Actually, uh, I, I can't see it, but I won a piano from it. So it was a very nice experience. Aside from that, uh, probably I'll continue writing through just like uh, probably like writing a story or something like that and just um, using those descriptions and whatnot. So, yeah, 
still working. That's on huge. It way. That's huge. You want an entire uh, keyboard? That's fresh, man. I'm so proud, proud of you, Elijah. That's that's huge. And I know you're creative in so many different ways too. Um, so yeah, so continue again to, to keep writing and. and you know, of course, I'm always um, down for, for you to shoot me an email if something, you're working on something or you want me to take a look, whatever it is, I'm always down for that. Um, so, yeah, so thank you uh, again, both Elijah um, and Samuel for, for, for sharing. Um, all right, so this is Black Joy, in case you just needed a reminder of what it looks like. And if you want to uh, cop this thing, you can go ahead and um, purchase it um, through Chapter 510, which is the uh, Department of Make Believe. So that's D-E-P-T of makebelieve.org or nomadicpress.org. So either of those places, you can um, find the book. And I believe it's going to be in the, the chat as well. Okay, so at Chapter 510, we believe in the power of importance um, of intergenerational intergenerational uh, mentorship for young emerging writers. For the Black Joy Project, we brought in a team of established writing mentors from the community to support these young writers as they prepared their poems for publishing. Prior to this workshop, most of the participants had no direct publishing experience. I believe Sam may have, but most of them were not versed in what publishing looks like and what better way to help them prepare their, their work to be published than through mentorship. I've had several folks mentor me and still mentor me in craft of poetry to this day. One in particular, Ian Haley Pollock, would also start out workshops by saying, I am no expert in this thing we call poetry. I'm just a little further along on the journey than you may be. And it was in that sentiment that I manifested the ideas and ideals of a mentor and a mentorship, which is the idea that mentors not only nudge you in the right direction, but they also help you see other paths and other possibilities um, of approaching poetry. I believe that to be true of the folks we brought in to help the Black Joy Poets prepare for publication. And we have the pleasure of hearing from a few of them tonight, starting with Vernon Keeve III. So Vernon Keeve uh, III is a Virginia born writer in California molded into an educator. Um, he lives and teaches in Oakland. His first book of poetry, Southern Migrant Mixtape, was published by Nomadic Press in 2018 and at Joint won the, um, the Penn Award too, uh, Oakland Penn Award. So uh, show all your love for Vernon Keeve III. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks for having me tonight. Thanks for, you know, putting me on Zoom. <laughs> Um, I'm going to um, read the poem that I wrote, actually, I'm a um, high school teacher, too. So um, when I was working with um, working with um, the Black Joy, like, workshop, um, and also just, like, working in my classroom, like, I started just thinking about, like, all of the Black boys um, that I taught over the years. Um, so a little poem just for everyone, all of them. <clears throat> Black boy, and this, and this is always growing too. Um, black boys play outside and are told to bathe and change before sitting at the table for dinner with their families. Black boys get shaken awake by mothers to get ready for school on gray cold mornings. Black boys waiting in colorful coats with their bright backpacks. Black boys love purple, but are taught it's a girl's color, so we hide it in the darkest of blues. Black boys wait for autumnal shaded school buses. Black boys trade magic and Pokemon cards in the library before the school bell sounds. Black boys run the class afraid of tardies and the mamas who will find out. Black boys play video games because the realities of freeway induced asthma attacks chokes them from basketball courts and football fields. Many black boys ignore these tight chests up and down courts and endure. And many black boys die from broken hearts. Black boys love their black teachers and smile and get excited when they see them outside of school. Those I know your mama and and I know your mama and daddy type teachers. See them in the choir stand on Sunday morning type teachers. Black boys want pets, dogs, cats, and rabbits. They enjoy watching them grow. Black boys like 
the animal some find unlovable like reptiles and amphibians. Black boys love birds because black boys want wings. Black boys praise God. Black boys sing. Black boys meditate and pray. Black boys get in trouble for bad grades. Black boys dream. Black boys run with arms outstretched, praying for the flight that was never given to Bigger Thomas. Black boys feel the pain of their dying mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers. Black boys talk about not aging into men, accepting their existence with the bleakest outcomes. Black boys will be boys who hope to become men who learn like everyone else to do what is right. Black boys need chances. Black boys camp, black boys hunt, black boys fish, black boys cry when we watch the fox and the hound, knowing that we are the fox. Black boys draw pictures and crayon worthy of anyone's refrigerator. Black boys want to write, write raps, write rhymes, write poetry. Black boys want to and deserve to write their own stories. Black boys fear the monsters in their closets, under their beds, and in the streets outside, outside of their homes. Fear those they should not fear or should. Black boys cower. Black boys have nightmares. Black boys climb into the beds with their parents seeking refuge from their fears. Black boys create. Black boys breathe. Black boys laugh. Black boys cry. Black boys bleed. Black boys breathe. Black boys feel pain. Black boys want to live. But black boys die. Black boys die. Black boys die more. But if you take anything from this poem, please take the line that Black boys, all Black boys, want to live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vernon, for sharing that. Um, and, and we'll get a chance to wrap uh, in just a minute. But thanks again for, for, for coming and the mentorship uh, with, with the Black, Black Dre Workshop and then sharing that piece. Um, so again, we'll, we'll chat with, with Vernon in just a second, but I want to introduce the next person who's going to be sharing some, some, some work with you all. And he was also a mentor at, uh, during the Black Joy Workshop, and his name is Darius Simpson. And Darius Simpson is a Black American spoken word artist, educator, writer, and proud wearer of Crocs from Akron, Ohio. He is a staff teaching artist with five, Chapter 510 and a candidate for his MFA in creative writing from Mills College which is in Oakland. His work has been featured in the Huffington Post, um, Mike Button Poetry, and Ted, uh, TEDx. And most recently, Darius is the recipient of the 2020 Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Stargent Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation. So give all your love at home, snaps, claps for Darius Simpson. Hey, y'all. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Daniel, for, for the invite to, to being a part of this project and the invite back today. I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking about the, the conversations that were going early, definitely really thinking about um, the, the relationship between joy and struggle. I think that's something I've just like been sitting here sitting out the window thinking about. Um, and so I'm, I'm just going to do a poem now. Get this, get this going. Uh, that deals a little bit in that, a little bit of joy and, and struggle. Um, so if I'm caught between a badge and a hard place, three hours after the street lights turn on, will you church it? Will you pass it along pews of almost saints until it reaches the whole congregation? Will you tithe it? Will you stretch it thin? like goat skin over the shell of a djembe drum? Will you slap it? Will you let the echo dance naked in the wet cave of your throat? Will you bark it? Will you sing it like my mother is listening? 
Will you inhale until your lungs nearly burst, then inhale some more, then and only then will you say my name? Will you put some stank on it? Will you juke joint James Brown it? Will you jerry curl spray it? How can I rest in peace or power if you get all lazy lipped when you talking about me? Will you scoop it thick? Will you stir it slow? Will you mac and cheese it? Will you mm, 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 to spread the savory over your tongue? Will you let it marinate? Will you serve it with Sunday dinner? Now, if you say my name and cast iron skillets don't start to rattling, that means you ain't say it loud enough. Will you say it again? If a redwood don't split open from the trunk, that means you ain't pronounce it right. Will you say it again? Will you redecorate a city and streams of fire after me? Will you paint downtown a scorching hue? Will you stain the sky in black smoke? Will you tell ghost stories over the ashes of this empire? Will you scream it? Will you stand in the clutter of rush hour traffic to let them know what kind of boots I wore? Will you stomp it into the soil of the last place where I laugh with my whole body? Will you dance it? Will you Saturday night praise it? Will you tambourine it? Will you drunken favorite song shout it? Will you full moon howl? Will you shriek? Will you chant? Will you live? Will you cry? For me, will you? Thank you. Ah, so fresh, 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 fresh. Thank you, Darius. Thank you so much for that poem. Um, and begging that question, right? And then and, and toying with struggle and joy. Um, again, uh, well, actually, we're going to jump into some questions right now, a bit of a, a Q&A um, right now. So um, before I do that, I do want to introduce our last um, uh, poet and mentor, um, the phenomenal Tango Ison Martin. Um, and I'll go ahead and introduce him now. However, he will be reading after we finish up the um, panel with the mentors. Um, so Tango Ison Martin is a poet activist, educator, and longtime supporter of Chapter 510. He was born in San Francisco and earned his MA at Columbia University. He is the author of Someone's Dead Already and Heaven is All, and Heaven is All Goodbyes, which received a 2018 American Book Award. So we'll hear from Tango just after we finish up these questions. But for now, Tango, Darius, and Vernon, if you could, um, please just turn your cameras on and unmute yourself so we can get into just a little bit of a chat. So uh, a, few, a few questions, and again, this conversation can go wherever you, your brilliant minds kind of take it. Um, so the, the, first, the first question is, um, what is Black Joy to you, and how is poetry a vehicle for it, or how can poetry be a vehicle for it? So anybody can jump in if, you, if you'd like. Or I can call them for, I can call them. <laughs> be bold, brother. <laughs> Um, I can I can go. Um, this is something I like. Um, I want to. I'm actually trying to explore with my students right now. Um, is and I don't know necessarily know. And I'm glad you asked this question. What is Black Joy for me? Um, because right now, Black Joy for me is um, getting all of my students to write like this narrative of their people and. Um, the thing I love about teaching in California is that like I walk into a classroom and I hear all of these like um, a lot of my students are black because I teach in Alta Ed and that's a whole nother whole nother story but um, I hear these southern accents and I'm from the south so I'm just like where does southern accent come from and then they tell me like you know my, my grandma from Alabama or something I'm like so you like picked up this accent but I want those stories um, black joy for me is being able to tell these stories. I love relaying the stories of my mother. Um, I love, my father recently passed away. I love finding joy and just thinking about the stories I can tell about our relationship. Um, so to me, like Black Joy is kind of keeping the narrative going. Um, and even like, I just, the reason, the reason I got into teaching is because I just felt like writing wasn't the skill of writing just wasn't my own. It just wasn't something that just I'm good at. Like, we've heard all of these voices tonight. Um, and it's just like getting other Black people to tell their stories. I find joy in that. 
Um, I like sitting in the barbershop when all of all of the brothers are just telling the stories. Um, I love like, you know, um, before the cookout, before the food is brought out and everyone's just telling those stories and finding those stories in, you know, places that are just steeped in our culture. Um, you know, just like, you know, even even the stories that are told when, uh, you know, I'm off book, when Blunt's being passed around, whatever you will, just those stories. And I love telling stories and I, I find joy in that. Um, and I want to record them and I want get to get other people to tell their stories. And that's where I find Black joy. Yeah, yeah, word. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Vernon. Um, there he is. So, Tango, either of you care to, to answer that answer that question? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'll go. Uh, yeah, I, I think a couple things. One, I think listening to Vernon talk about it, I was thinking about all the places that Black joy exists, and I can't think of a place where I've seen Black folks gather as some some semblance of joy wasn't put on it, including you know at protests. Uh, uh, and so, like, I think, I think Black joy is really a part of, of, of Blackness in all the ways that it shows up in all the places. I think that there are these moments in which, like, yes, of course, the laughter um, and storytelling, all of these things. But for me, um, Black joy is dancing, right? I, I, don't, I don't have much other, like, these, like, bodily feelings and physical reactions of joy um, purer than when I'm watching other Black folks dance together, dance individually. And what I think about it is, is it's this unrestricted movement. Um, so whether it's on a dance floor, whether it's on a sidewalk or a train, it's just like the, the decision to move and the commitment to that thing, right? Um, especially given all the ways that uh, Blackness is commanded, um, told to restrict it into stillness, uh, that, that choice to move especially on beat is, is just something that is otherworldly to me. And so I think there's, there's a lot of black joy and movement and my particular joy is definitely derived from how I move my body and how I'm able to see my people move their bodies too. Yeah, yeah, black joy is dance. I love that. I, 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 I find that I have a similar thought um, when it comes to like music, right? And listening to music, but I guess those, are, those two are kind of interconnected, right? Music and, and dancing. Um, but yeah, thanks for sharing Darius. Uh, Tango, do you wanna, uh, speak to what Black Joy is for you, and then how can writing or poetry maybe be a vehicle for it? Black, Black Joy is under fire right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Black, Black, I think, I think uh, man, it, it, uh, it's almost like a, a phase of uh, like black improvisation or 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 or, or black joy is uh is really gonna have to i mean it's kind of weird speaking so metaphysically about uh, about about really these these components of unity right to me it's like black unity and and also kind of like a unity with the cosmos you know uh uh manifesting itself you know, lightheartedly, tenderly, vulnerably, you know, angrily. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think that we're, we're in a, we're like, uh, like, something is really wrong right now, you know what I mean? And, and uh, I, I, I have, I have this, this like anxiety, um, you know, usually I, I, I always have kind of a sense that people can still, that, 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 we haven't gone too far, but to be uh, to be frank, I, 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 this growing anxiety is kind of like been looming in my mind that man, what you know, the 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 the, the, the cord is gonna snap any day now. Um, you know, the we we don't have as much time. You know, almost like psyche wise. Um, we don't have actually the same room, psyche wise, psyche wise or consciousness wise, and, and so um, you know. I, 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 so what is how? How do we? You know, it, it, that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to remedy it, uh, remedy consciousness sternly, and, and you know, joy will always. You know, joy is joy has access to every second, um, but but you know 
kind of like uh, I, I think I, I just I'm, I'm worried about our our whole right now. I'm, I'm worried about our union. And, and of course, you know, po poetry is, um, you know, cultural work in general is is um, is a necessary and crucial uh, tool for that cultural work. Yeah, I mean, so many things too there, right? Um, I, I was particularly drawn to to you saying like the way that we manifest things, right? In particular, joy, of course. And um, that's something that I actually I've, chew, I've kind of chewed on recently is this idea of like manifesting not just joy, but you know, anything, any kind of thing that I want to feel or, or, or be a part of. Um, so, so that's, yeah, thanks for sharing that. The whole idea of being able to manifest our, our own joy. Cause a lot of folks think that like joy is something that um, is external or things that, that maybe like somebody else is maybe um, providing for you. Right. As opposed to something that you you're able or you're capable of manifesting yourself. Um, so that's, that was interesting. And that, that kind of, kind of struck me so so thanks for sharing that but along similar lines that you're talking about poetry is is it's kind of like culture work and, and it's a it's a way for us to kind of take a second and think about um the way that we connect with words and in the ways that words also connect with people so um so uh, ocean vong said in an interview that writing is nothing um nothing but caring for small things and that young people should write because if nothing else it teaches them care and to care for small things so of course, you know, thinking about like the intricacies and the nuances of poetry in terms of craft, all that kind of stuff. Um, but even, you know, even if you zoom out, right? Poetry has to do with caring enough for like this small thing, you know, via either, you know, performance or, or even, you know, on the page. It's caring about the words, the order of the words, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so I agree with that, but I'm, I'm curious what you all think of the importance of engaging young folks in, in, in writing, but then, in particular poetry, like what is it about poetry that may create that kind of um, um, sense of, of empathic care? Um, so I'll start, we'll start, I'll call you out this time. Uh, we'll start with Vernon. Go ahead and if you can answer or, or address that. Um, uh, <clears throat> see, like I can only, I can, right now I'm just thinking maybe it's just because of my, my day. I'm just, I still have my teacher hat on. <laughs> so I'm thinking about like, the things I do to get my students to write poetry. So I'm thinking about like one of the things I do early in the year, usually, or like early in the lesson of poetry, I just tell my students to go outside and to describe something without telling us what it is. So pretty much they're writing these riddles. They have to describe something, they come back into the classroom, they have to read it to us, and we have to kind of guess what they are. So, you know, like we do this like a couple days in a row. So like by like the third day, they're kind of like they're really catching on and they're really like, oh, I need to stump my class. I really need to. So like me giving my students that is like the difference for them telling me like, you know, there's a fence right there. And the difference in that line and them saying like, there's this barrier that divides us that I walk past every day and it, I, I continue to change, but it remains the same. Like it's the difference between those two lines. It's like, it gives them, it like opens a door. It allows them to like, just expand the ways in which they write like almost immediately. Um, it's like a big bang in their head, like, um, it's like you, when, 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 when you, the ways in which I see the aha moments in the room, <laughs> like just with like the third day of having my students go outside, stare at something for five minutes, and then try to describe it in a way that the class has to guess what it is. Like, like it just, it just changes their writing from, from like immediately. Um, so I feel like just, giving them poetry just allows them to describe the world in ways they never imagined. Um, and it just gives them curiosity for, for more language and to access more language to describe everything that they're experiencing, seeing, and taking in. Um, and that's, that's all I have on that right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Word. Thanks for 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 sharing, Vernon. Um, Darius, do you have anything to to add or to chime in at all? 
thinking about care, how poetry creates care. Does it create care for you? What are your thoughts on, on that? Empathy, does it create any kind of empathy, any sense of empathy? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I, I, whenever we remember talking, I, I start thinking about my, my childhood and writing, he starts talking about his students and I imagine myself as a student, I start thinking back to when. Sorry, <laughs> 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 right, Mr. Mr. Trey. Uh, nah, uh, I think that what I, when, I'm, when I'm thinking about the, the possibilities of writing, I think immediately about um, transformation. So uh, Vernon was talking about the, the changes that, that happen over time. And I think just the act of writing in, in itself is, is a, a transformative process because you're taking in, whether you're looking at a thing, whether you're pulling out a feeling or pulling up a memory, it's like you're taking that and then transforming it to the page. Or um, Tango talks a lot of his when he, when he does the workshops and teaches us the tone things about synthesis and just that that it, taking part in that process expands the possibilities of what um of what we uh, extends what we understand is possible um and so i think yeah there's 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 power in the possibility for care for oneself um and creating an, a, a greater understanding of for example defense or any other thing that you might be writing about um getting a good a better understanding of the context of the thing it allows a fuller story and through a fuller story, I think there's a, a care and empathy because you see yourself in the thing and around it. So I go from writing about the pole outside my window to writing about the neighborhood and the open and that I see and find myself interacting with those things. Um, and yeah, yeah, so I think care, care and empathy are necessary, uh, a necessary part of writing, a necessary part of the process in writing for transformation. Word. Thanks. Thanks, Darius, for sharing. Um, and Tango, do you have anything to add or chime in? Uh, <laughs> Shit, man, I got, <laughs> I got, <laughs> I got, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just like, you know, these, these, these times are, are, are just, uh, are, are moving. Um, just so, like, so, like uh man so so uh so uh disconcertingly it, it I, I damn near be on some you know like man what's what's my you know last will and testament advice um <laughs> if, if if you know if i <laughs> if we don't see each other in a week <laughs> i mean i i i would, I would I, man it, it's it's got to be a human we got to humanize ourselves we got to humanize each other you know and yeah um you know that 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 it that really is your only task if you can orient yourself that way you know the unity takes care of itself the craft takes care of itself man just be whole um whole human beings and uh you know paulo Freire uh said uh, some interesting pedagogy of the press i think he said like some, I, I'm going to mess it up, but something to the fact that naming, to name things, to name your world is to be a human being within it. Mm -hmm. And and so that, you know, I, I think that's that's where, you know, craft is the, you know, poetry, writing or whatever, you, however, you, whatever you move the pen, uh, whatever happens when you move the pen is that, um, is that power. And which, and, which, and which is really the, before there's any, Political power or, or or military power or any kind of other little goofy <laughs> power. Uh, it's that it begins with that power of naming. You know, that's 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 the flicker uh, from which any everything else can uh, you know really take care of itself. So um, it just you know the human thing. <laughs> that's, that, that's that's my vote <laughs> yeah yeah no that's that's actually huge too and and again um just speaking about like how you know if i if i'm not here next week right what, what am i going to leave you with and then just speaking to the humanity in in other people or you know in yourself and in connecting via that humanity like and then of course in like in the, in the thought of of black people dying um uh you know or being murdered rather by you know by the state oftentimes the the excuse or the rationale is that oh they're not human so it's okay i mean that's not like a new thing a new concept right so then for black folks in particular 
black writers um, and then, you know, the Black Joy Workshop has to do with, no, I'm a human and then my voice is, is valid because I'm a human. And also um, I have things to say that come from my humanity. So that's huge. Um, and then real quick, we have like a minute. So like maybe like a minute each person um, thinking about uh, humanity, but then also like folks that um, maybe have, have drawn you to that notion of, of humanity and have helped shaped you. Um, Cause you all helped shape and cultivate the, the writers of the Black Joy Anthology, but like who are some of the folks or mentors or, or folks that maybe you look up to or that have helped you along the way or nudged you um, so again, like maybe one minute each real quick, uh, Tango, we'll start with you. Is there anybody that, you know, has kind of inspired you or, or shaped you or molded you? Yeah, you know, uh, in, in my tender age, uh, the, the cat, the first time I really saw, you know, a parallel universe touchdown in this one was, uh, when I saw, uh, Mark Bamuthi Joseph, um, perform and, and I got to be around him you know when I was a kid and uh and that was you know that seeing people you know he was walking on water man <laughs> you know <laughs> it's just like and, and you know it's something that's all you need you just need to see somebody walk on water and it will uh it was it will set you along the path it, it was it was he was the first kid I'm talking about like like if I to be more specific about his craft and to kind of riff on my preamble like it really with him it was like watching a world change like you know now we are in my mind and uh and i i i, I never see somebody set such a singular um just kind of like autonomous um you know uh, uh, set down a world in front of people um that was a a severe break in regular schedule programming. And it was yeah. really just an extension of his, really his, his, his like cosmological, um, really curiosity, you know, it was, it, it was, it was just, it was a, it was a beautiful and mighty thing to watch, especially as we were sitting in a post-apocalyptic Reaganomic, you know what I mean? Just brutal, brutal reality you know so i, I would have to say uh by multi mark mark by multi joseph cool cool um darius you want to jump in uh, yeah thinking about he i really didn't start really even I'm, when you say humanity i think about like when i started articulating like my humanity as, as something that's, that's important and not in an arbitrary or abstract way but like really something to seek to seek after um and it was reading pedagogy the oppressed um uh, and that like that like damn humanity to be human like to to focus on to shift my relationships my conversations my political action my anything i do towards humanity is actually against and in resistance of um whatever oppressive system i'm, I'm focusing on or thinking about in that moment so that and then tango man uh, the poem yeah. and the workshops the talks all the things That's, mm -hmm. yeah. Where, where? Thanks, Darius. Uh, Vernon, you want to chime in here? Um, I guess like someone who I always just seems to point me, I feel point me in the right direction is Zora Neale Hurston. Um, and just um, the ways in which she wrote about everything, or at least I feel tried to about the Black community. It wasn't just about, you know, writing your story. It was about like kind of like going out and researching and getting the stories of those who didn't even have the power to tell their own. Um, but like not doing that, but all, like I'm, I'm trying, I want to go out there and just encourage other people to tell their stories. But, um, hopefully along the way, um, you know, uh, maybe I can do some of the research too, some of the communitarian research that she did. Um, Cause I just love, I love that stuff. I love oral, I love our oral history as well. As, uh, my our oral history also drives me as much as our written history. Yeah. Um, and uh, another person is this book that I just read like a year and a half ago, and I cannot stop telling people to read it. Is Louise Merriweather's um, uh, "Daddy Was a Number Runner," um, and just that book itself, the ways in which that author writes about blackness. I don't understand why this just wasn't a pillar 
and you know everything that we had to read is in black academia um and also the only three um um professors in my mfa program opal palmer adisa ishmael reed and al young <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, my north star in my very white mfa program <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's too often the case. <laughs> too often the case. Um, we're, well, well. Thanks again, Tongo, Darius, Vernon, for engaging in that in that dialogue. Um, Tongo, you want to uh, close this little segment out with, with by sharing a poem, please. Yeah. Yeah, uh, 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 uh. Trey, Trey got me ready to plug a book too, though. Hold on. Because <laughs> I just got my hands on this right here. Does this show up the proper way? Yep, we can see yeah. it. The dawning of the apocalypse. Yep. Gerald mm. Horn, man. You know, this This is yep. a, 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 you know, I damn near feel like reading from this instead of saying a poem. <laughs> People know I'm always evangelizing about Gerald Horn, and uh, I'm only a few pages in. This latest book, it's like listening to Monk or something. Um, but uh, uh, <clears throat> I digress. Um, I I talk um, I talk facing away from the dead. Uh, they replaced me with the change in my pocket, uh, a penny that's yet to be invented. They say you have to know how to cut a throat on the way to cutting a throat. After sleeping on a mattress made from two garbage bags of clothes, I became content with the small gestures of plantation fires. Uh, playing with couch ashes, I realized how weird the universe was. It exists in so many places, so many random things. It interrupts me while I'm trying to dream. I like your clay correspondence, Lord. Uh, to be transparent, I have 20 books next to a bullet like an old man giving advice at the beginning of a revolution. I've really done it, Lord. Explored the mumbles of my mind, explored what's naturally there, and I found no brainwashing. Yeah, I found Africa, Lord. I have a future. It takes place in the diaspora south. I have morning possessions, modern militancy. I mean, windows to the south. I'll walk on a missile for food. I guess you will not want flowers for a few years, Lord. Will I be tied face to face with the country I murdered, merged with the slaughter? Our old metal versus new metal. Our old metal versus a pool of meandering and peerless faces and multiculturalism of sorts. You know, they replaced me with a comedian's chest cavity. Instead of a chest cavity held tight, it takes a violent middle man for me to talk to myself. Stories that travel through other people's stories. A song about a song. A hemisphere about a hemisphere. <laughs> stories that travel through a conquered poet. Hey, my mother remembers Africa, Lord. She killed on behalf of you, Lord. I wore a machete all winter and no one asked me what it meant. I read 1,000 books in front of the world. You know what I do is fight poems and sleep through decades in San Francisco prayer circles, watch people play for post-working class associative surfaces, the recreations of a governor's desk. I mean, ruling class art of utility, playing fine a sociopathic bureaucrat. A day some white people scare even easier. TV in a basket next to a ceramic baby wearing ceramic armor, musket progeny fantasizing through the art of the poor, their trendy latches locked before a guy, black art hunted down like a dog. Uh, hand over my friends, Lord. Lord, I think I'm gonna die in the war. Unelected white people in my small house like a blues song of no spiritual effect. Or a dollhouse H-bomb. Pony show near dead bodies. Apartheid weddings that go right. Apartheid white people who give birth to mathematicians. The, the spiritual continuity of barracks and police stations. The chemical interpretation of a Sunday trip to church. Church mills in their pockets, a river mistaken for a talking river. No autobiography outside of small personal victories of violence and drug use. Made in the image of God trinkets with white abolitionists confided in their children about. Chemical assurances that they will switch from black artists to white artists. From black guy to white guy. From black worker to white worker. I think about you cautiously, Lord. In the same way I think about my childhood, Lord. <laughs> Foxhole Friday nights, most of life is mute. A comedian points out a planter's field to a priest, King Sugar King, King Cotton. King Revolutionary to Bowler Central, containing all modes of shallow introduction, introducing an unlisted planet class speaking about fevers and balance sheets and reassuring the masses that we can figure out our fathers later. A priest took my mother lightly, Lord. Stood in front of parishioners, re-raveling fantasies about black art. Priest reading confidently before I broke him and broke his parallel. You know, after the day, I've never been a poet before. Little brother watches his big brother's friends. They leave rifles on sheltered walls. They agree with me and call it literature. It's a simple matter, this revolution thing. To really lie to no one. To keep nothing godlike. To 
to write a poem for God. Word, 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 word. Thank you, thank you so much, Tango, for sharing that. Um, much love, sharing that piece. Much love, much love. Uh, thanks again to all the, the the mentors. Thanks for for stopping by and sharing your wisdom and your and your work, your creativity. Um, thank you again to the to the poets. Um, and it was a joy just being able to come and share um, this this space, but then also share and celebrate um, the Black Joy Anthology. Um, again, right? We, we celebrated it when it released, but it was such a pleasure to kind of release it, re-release it, and re-share it, and re-celebrate it um, again. So again, thank you so much. Um, and, and so Chapter 510 believes that writing is an act of liberation. So please join us as we support the next generation of Oakland youth to write with confidence and joy. And you can do so by visiting chapter510.org to find out more about programs and how to get involved. Um, just to close us out, because I think Tango was touching on like this idea of, of um, like being attacked, our unity being attacked, our culture kind of like in this place of, of, of I guess, um, vulnerability or just this place where like, it's, it's so tough to like conceptualize um, joy when, when our joy is being attacked. So, so anyways, uh, my sentiment is, is in this moment right now, is, is much different than joy. And so I'm gonna share a poem um, called Today's Prayer that kind of speaks to that. And it starts with the quote, my son, tell them the body is a blade that sharpens by cutting. Today's prayer is for honing still, a third testament that black folks anchor to their galvanized body in ink. Today's prayer is for a radical revision. In this variation, Jesus grew up in Oakland off seminary and Oakland don't have two cheeks after the first to discover how sharp black can be. In this variation, Simon, Andrew, and John are Andrew, or I'm sorry, are Angela, Eldridge, and Huey. Today's prayer is for honing still in a chopping block. Today's prayer is for peer review. Today's prayer is to revise and resubmit. Today's prayer doesn't include submission. Today's prayer is broadcast from Calvary and Longinus did not get the good side. In this variation, we don't lose blood, just dull shrapnel. Today's prayer is for a blade. Today's prayer is for a self-sharpening body. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lucina, are you there? You want to take over? Hi. Here? Yeah. Can I just speak for everyone? Amazing. Wow. <laughs> that was incredible, everyone. I just wanted to close out the night with some thanks and appreciation. Um, first of all, I want to thank you to Daniel, Samuel, Elijah, Vernon, Darius, and Tongo for your words tonight. Just, just incredible. And also I want to thank uh, Jehan at Chapter 510 for his role in all of this. I also want to thank, uh, give thanks to my colleagues here at California Humanities who've been working on this event. And again, special thanks to my colleague John who coordinated the event uh, and handled things behind the scene. Thanks to Renee for helping us with technology and Cherie for building our wonderful audience. Uh, but last, last but not least, I want to thank our audience. I got to say the love that was coming through the chat was just incredible. It's really beautiful. Uh, if you would like to purchase the book, Black Joy, as we've been mentioning, you can purchase it um, at nomadicpress.org or Department of Maple Leaf, if, as folks have been saying. Video of this event will be posted on California Humanities YouTube channel in the coming days. And for those of us who are interested uh, sticking around a little bit, the panelists will be here to answer some questions and mingle a little bit. So thank you. Where's Sam, you still there? Oh, cool, cool, cool. DJ. There's some questions on the chat. I need a DJ. Where? Daniel, can you see some of the questions? On yeah, the and let me and let me. I'll ask. I'll just kind of sift through and try to, you know, get through them. All right. So, Tango, um, what was the name of your piece, please? If there's a name of the the piece you perform. I believe the poem is called "A Good Earth." Uh, 
but that might just be one of the old working titles good in earth. my head or something like that. Good earth. A good earth. <laughs> I think a good earth is <laughs> Cool. They got it. They said, thank you. If you have a question or something you want to ask or chime in, uh, put it at the bottom, like do it, type it now, because otherwise there's a million messages in this chat. So I'm going to have to scroll all the way through. Uh, please, please do more regular readings on Zoom. I, I know, you know, you folks have, have, folks have stuff going on. I know, um, well, I don't know, Darius, you got some stuff coming up or anything that, that maybe you want to plug or share? No? Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Tongo, you got some coming up? Trey? Um, I'm actually organizing um, a, a Black horror sci-fi, um, Black Brown, marginalized um, writer sci-fi reading. Um, so if you um, do want to read and are potentially interested in reading on um, Halloween night um, for my Hydra reading, please email me at thirdvernon at gmail.com. And I will put that in the chat as well. Cool, cool. Where can we read that poem that Vernon read tonight? Is it in that, is it in that Southern Migrant mixtapes? Um, that is not in Southern Migrant oh. mixtapes. I'm sorry. Um, you know, you know, I've tried to send it places, but no, no, nobody wants to take it. Um, so it just didn't exist with me right now. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, we got to hear it, and obviously it was a hit because um, folks are asking where to where to revisit it. So, um, so thanks for sharing. Nonetheless, uh, let's see a couple more. Uh, how do you approach Black youth to get more involved in writing of poetry? Uh, anybody want to take a stab or 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 uh, answer that question? How do you approach Black youth to get more involved in writing and poetry? Um, I can I answer it. Is... I'm sorry. No, you can go ahead, man. Um, I, I, I kind of just like start with Oakland. Um, I really do love using Oakland as a way in, um, and especially like with using like a lot of like I, now, now I need to probably start bringing some Black Joy um, poets into my classroom uh, because I like to start with where they're at so they can start seeing how poets are already writing about their city um, and then get inspired from, from there. Um, and Oakland just has a very rich literary scene. And as you can see, you can even get the book tonight <laughs> um, and see how poets are already writing about Oakland. Um, share it with your students, get them to talk about it, um, talk about the issues that the, the poem is like speaking to, um, and then they just take it from there literally. They'll, they'll take it from there. You'll see what scaffolds you need to add each day. Cool, cool, cool. Anybody else have any thoughts? Sam, were you going to chime in? Yeah, I just wanted to, I, I guess, give the perspective of. I guess in black youth, um, <laughs> who was kind of, um, who, who once didn't think that poems and writing were for him. I think you have to show them that, you have to show them black poets, you have to show them black writers, right? Like the, the poetry that I was taught in classrooms was Emily Dickinson, Walt Whitman and Shakespeare. And none of those people were writing about things that I felt like were relevant to me and none of those people were alive and none of those people were black. And so, you know, the kind of logical conclusion that I went through and that I think a lot of students go through is, well, poetry is for dead white people. And if they're, if it's for people who are alive, then they're white as well. And I think um, you have to show them living poets, you have to show them black poets, you have to show them poets from their city. Um, and, then it, and then it kind of opens the gates to it being something that they can do as well. Word, 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 word. Um, looks like we have another question in the Q&A. Any suggestions for Black folks um, friendly digital, oh, maybe that are friendly digital online spaces given for those of us looking to learn or workshop uh, poetry? So looks like it's they're interested in a Black space uh, to workshop uh, poetry. Any recommendations, suggestions on that? Online, digital. No workshops. Um, Bruce Slam once a month they do a um, 
a free writing workshop on Saturdays, you can go to their their Twitter or their um, their Instagram or their website. Sign up and let you know. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So that's the Root Slam. Um, looks like once a month. It's like on a Saturday or something like that, right? It's some Saturday of the month. Yeah, fourth Saturday. It's it's one. Saturday. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but if you if you you can look up you know the root slam and I'm sure you'll find um, more info about about that workshop. Uh, let's see, folks are looking. Oh, here we go. How has the dynamic of working as a mentor or being a mentee shaped your own approach to poetry? How has the dynamic of working as a mentor or being a mentee shaped your own approach to poetry? Any um, thoughts working as a mentor, being a mentee, shaped your own approach? I'll say, I mean, for me, um, just, you know, being in education, uh, you know, engaging, I, like I wanted to be an educator um, because I enjoy like engaging in, in dialogue, in conversation, in the toying, right, with words and poetry and, and all that stuff. So it's not necessarily like me being a mentor, um, or even like when I was, you know, as I still am a mentee, I think it's I'm much more interested in like um uh like the 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 battle, right, or the war that exists between like talking about language and talking about what language can be and trying to, I guess, communicate or make things as vivid as possible. Um so 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 yeah, I don't know if there's an answer that, that answers your question. Um, but I'm thinking more about like how that relationship of of you know myself to an educator. I'm sorry to to somebody educating me, and then also me to you know folks that may be my mentees. I'm thinking about just what that relationship has been and how it's developed and how it's made me a better person um, and a better writer, of course, too. But just how how I've been able to kind of grow just from that interaction, not necessarily through like the power dynamic of I'm the teacher and they're the student, right? But just the the relationship of of kind of working through words right and poetry together mm -hmm. yeah um one of the a quote i always go back to um when i was coming moving out here someone i used to work in a grocery store with they said teachers should all i mean artists should always teach what they love um, and i just feel like at every every moment when i felt like i couldn't like I, I felt like I, I I had written everything I could write. Um, I was done with writing. Um, when I was in my MFA program, I started like um, working in an after school program with youth to get them to write. Um, and it helped me like um, you find ways because you're constantly looking for ways to inspire your students to get them to write and looking for strategies to get them to write and that just kind of forces you to continually analyze your process and stuff you want to write about. Um, and also, like, um, fortunately for me, like, um, now if you're like an English teacher, um, they kind of make you teach history too. Um, of course, I didn't go to school for that. So like, it requires me to do homework. Um, and I do like to re write historical fiction. Um, so it just kind of forces me to learn stuff. and be able to add more stuff to my own writing so like um anytime you're in that like mentor mentee um you're 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 really in you're you're in inspiring yourself by inspiring that person or trying to inspire that person um it's just like a uh what is it a symbiotic relationship that works pretty well yeah yeah, 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 word. Okay, so we ran out of time here, but um, before we go, there was someone that asked for like uh, a list of all the poets or a list of the folks that participated and how to contact um, everyone. So if you guys want to, feel free to drop your, I don't know, you know maybe websites, emails or whatever in the chat so that that person can, um, you know, get that info. Um, and uh, there's one other thing. Uh, so Chapter 510 is offering free after school writing workshops every week. Uh, this school year. And so you can find out more about that um, via chapter510.org. So if you want to learn more about those workshops, then go ahead and, um, uh, you know, tune into chapter510.org. Uh, looks like we're, we're dropping emails. 
contact stuff in the chat. For those of you that want to get in contact or stay connected, um, you can do so there. Hey, uh, um, Daniel might want to check. I think there's one more question. Yeah, we're, we're out of time, though. We, oh, okay, I got gotcha, you. Yeah, gotcha. we're, we're up against time. That's all. Uh, that's a shame. It was a good one, too. <laughs> Answer it then. What is it? Answer it real quick. Go ahead, Elijah. Um, all right, so I'm reading it right now. Um, of course, there will be. Um, so the main question was just talking about how, like, the media doesn't really promote, like, ascension and whatnot and just, like, wokeness in general. Um, I think there, I think there is sort of uh, something like that going on right now. And, of course, it's going to be a slow process. So give also, it time. And as long as people are interacting with it, it'll grow over time. Also, a spoken word artist from Stockton, from California, just won, I think, America's Got Talent or something like that, too. Um, big deal, right? Cats usually don't win those kind of competitions spitting poems. So, so that's dope for the culture, right? Um, right there's been right. spoken word on, on late night, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy Fallon, right? Judy Francisco was on, I think Jimmy Fallon or something like that. Big deal, right? For the poetry culture um, in terms of, of those platforms and, and recognizing that poetry is what kind of moves the world and drives the world, right? Joseph Stalin came into power. He was like, yo, kill all the poets. Why? Because poets have the power and like the ability to, to kind of shape and move things. So, um word 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 all right i think we're out of time though um so thanks again panelists thanks again folks that have stuck around um but i think that's it for our our program tonight